Hi everyone, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Naral and I'm a research scientist based at the University of Technology, Sydney. I'm a microbiologist and I'm really interested in understanding how bacteria cause infections and finding new ways to treat or prevent these infections. And that's how I ended up researching medicinal honey. My research focuses on two main areas. The first is looking at the antibacterial activity of honey and how we can use it directly to treat infections, for example, for wounds or skin infections. The second is looking at whether eating honey has any therapeutic benefits, specifically whether honey can act as a prebiotic food that promotes good gut health. And my talk today will be mainly focused on this area. So we know that honey was used very effectively as a medicine throughout history, and it still remains in use today, although not as much as we'd like to see. The reason that it's been so popular as a medicine is because honey can have broad spectrum antimicrobial activity, which means that it can kill bacteria and other microbes that cause infections. The most popular use of honey has been as a topical treatment, particularly for wounds and skin infections, and there have been many records of its use in this way. Just as an example, there are extensive records from ancient Egypt showing the use of honey as a wound salve, and it was used in the complex surgeries performed by the ancient Egyptians, like circumcisions, which is denoted in the graphic here. The main reason that honey fell out of favour as the preferred medicine was because it, we discovered and started using antibiotics in the 1940s. But today, we have a shortage of effective antibiotic treatment options for infections because we're seeing a huge increase globally in the number of antibiotic resistant bacteria, or superbugs. And this happens because bacteria have learned to fight off the effects of our antibiotic drugs much quicker than we can discover and make new ones. Antibiotics kill bacteria or slow down their growth so much that they can no longer cause infection. And they do this by targeting certain things in bacteria, like their protective cell wall or parts of their metabolism, just like we can see in this cartoon here. But bacteria evolve and change very quickly. So this means that they can learn to fight off or resist the effects of the antibiotic drug so they no longer have an effect. This is what's known as antibiotic resistance. It's not that the drugs simply stop working, but the bacteria have changed to fight off the effect of the drug, and we call these bacteria superbugs. When bacteria become superbugs, they hold on to what gives them the ability to resist antibiotics in their DNA, because it gives them a competitive edge in order to survive. They can also swap and share this DNA with other bacteria, which means that they can give and take the ability to resist other antibiotics as well. So, what we end up with is many different types of bacteria with the ability to resist many different antibiotic drugs. And this makes treating superbug infections incredibly difficult. Probably one of the most exciting things about honey scientifically is that bacteria don't seem to develop resistance to its killing effects. Even though honey has been used for thousands of years, there have been no reported cases of honey resistant superbugs. And we can't generate honey resistance in the lab either. What we do in the lab is treat bacteria with increasing doses of honey or antibiotic to train them to become resistant to the treatment. And in the results here, when the graph deviates above that red dotted line, it means that these bacteria are resistant, so the treatment is no longer effective. If we follow the black line, which is the antibiotic treatment, we can see resistance within just two weeks. At the 15 day mark, it crosses that red uh, dotted line, the threshold. So the bacteria just become more and more resistant as the days progress because you can see that that line increases dramatically. When we look at the blue line, which represents the honey experiment, the line never crosses that red dotted line, that resistance threshold. So no matter how long we train the bacteria to fight off the honey, they just can't do it. We've tried this with lots of different types of bacteria and honey, and the results are always the same. So one of the most common misconceptions is that all honey is the same, but honey isn't a generic or a standard product. It's very complex with over 200 components. So in the same way that different honeys can look and taste very different, they can also have very different medicinal properties. There are multiple factors that contribute to its antimicrobial activity, and all honeys will have some degree of antibacterial activity, but not all are at levels that can quickly clear infections. The first factor is that honey is high in sugar which means that it has very little water available. And just like us, bacteria need water in order to survive. Honey also has a low pH, which creates an acidic environment, and most bacteria can't tolerate this. These two factors are similar in most honeys, but they make up only a very small amount of the total activity we see. So honeys with activity coming from just these two factors alone are unlikely to be a good substitute for topical antibiotics. 
The main reason for significant activity in some honeys is because of the production of hydrogen peroxide, which is like a weak bleach and this is toxic to bacteria. This peroxide based activity varies hugely from one honey type to another and it's dependent on the floral source. For example, Jarrah and spotted gum honeys can have very high levels of this type of activity. Then there are some very rare honeys with high levels of activity beyond the peroxide activity and this is also linked to floral factors. The most famous example of this type of activity is seen in Manuka honey from New Zealand or the related Manuka type honeys from Australia. Because of these antibacterial components, this is probably why we see no resistance. It's great for using honey as an antimicrobial because it means that it's unlikely that bacteria will be able to develop resistance anytime soon. There are too many factors at play here. But we know that this use is mostly limited to topical applications. So why is there a lot of evidence that honey also works internally? Is it just about stopping the growth of those nasty infection causing bacteria or is there another bioactivity or other bioactivities of honey that we can use therapeutically? With all of this in mind, there are lots of things that we want to learn from honey, partly driven by scientific curiosity, but also because we want honey to be a viable treatment option and for the most appropriate honey to be used in the most appropriate way. So we're working on questions like what makes honey a good antimicrobial and is this use only limited to its topical use or can we use these antimicrobial properties systemically as well? Are there any benefits of eating honey? For example, can honey be working as a good prebiotic food? Does it affect our gut microbiome in some kind of way? What contributes to the prebiotic effect if we do have one? And can we use honey to re-engineer a compromised gut microbiome? So as an example, can we target gut related conditions? And finally, what influences the bioactivity of honey? So whether we're looking at this prebiotic activity or the antimicrobial activity, what kind of contributions do, do the floral source, the geographic origin or bee related factors and environmental factors play in this bioactivity? Like its other medicinal uses, there is a long history of use of honey as a remedy for many digestive ailments. And there are plenty of records throughout history about this use. For example, here we have an ancient Arab script showing the making of medicine from honey. And this medicine was prescribed specifically for digestive ailments like stomach and intestinal bloating or swelling, diarrhea and cramping. But it's unlikely that the use of honey for digestive ailments is due to that antimicrobial activity because we wouldn't expect this type of activity to survive in our digestive process. So we think that honey might be acting in a different way when we eat it, and this could be linked to the millions of bacteria living in our gut, known as our gut microbiome. We're also appreciating more and more that not all bacteria and microbes are bad. Most are actually good for us. So over the past century, there's been a shift from just trying to get rid of all bacteria and microbes to trying to nurture and harbor the right types in the right balance. When we talk about microbiomes, we're referring to communities of bacteria and other microorganisms that live in a particular habitat. And these can be found everywhere. They're in the soil, in the air, or in, in the water, and of course, on and inside of us as well. We now understand that bacteria are essential to our survival and they perform a range of very important functions in the environment and also in our bodies. The largest population of bacteria in the human body lives in our gut. And there's a lot of research now targeted in trying to understand what it is these gut bacteria do and just how important they are to our overall health. What we do know is that these bacteria influence the normal functioning of our bodies and our nutrition and health. They can help to build our immune systems and fight off infections and disease. They help us digest our food, they make essential vitamins, and they remove toxins from our bodies. They also influence our hormones, our immune system, and even the way our brains work. And because of all of these really important roles, we're very focused on trying to create and maintain a healthy gut. And we still don't know exactly what a healthy human gut should look like yet, but what we do know is that it's important to have lots of different types of bacteria and that they should be in a balance of beneficial and even some that are normally thought of, of as potentially harmful types. When the balance of our gut bacteria is off, that's when we start to see things like bowel disease, including colon cancer, ir irritable bowel syndrome, irritable bowel disease, and also conditions outside of the gut too. Our gut bacteria seem to influence whether we get fat, suffer from allergies or heart conditions, or even mental health issues. 
We can also see the balance in our gut disrupted if we get a gut infection. That happens when potentially harmful bacteria, like this little red bacteria that's touching the intestinal barrier there, breach that protective barrier of our intestines and set up a camp here. So essentially, the numbers of the potentially harmful bacteria outweigh the numbers of the beneficial ones. One particularly problematic example of a gut infection, and one that we're really interested in working on, is called C. difficile infection. Now this one's caused by a particular type of bacteria called C. difficile, and it often happens after we take a course of antibiotics, because those antibiotics wipe out most of our gut bacteria, including the beneficial ones, and it allows these potentially harmful C. difficile to really quickly populate our gut. In some cases, it just presents as mild diarrhea, but it can very quickly progress to life-threatening inflammation of the bowels. And because there aren't many effective treatments for this gut infection, we're interested in understanding if we can use honey to help here. So there are a few different ways that we can manipulate the balance of our gut bacteria. Our lifestyles and hygiene habits, and whether we take antibiotics, affects this balance. And of course, our diet plays an important role too, because certain foods that we eat, called prebiotics, can also feed our gut bacteria. A prebiotic food is a complex carbohydrate or a complex sugar, like those found in many root vegetables, that we don't digest ourselves. So it reaches our lower gut or our colon, where it can be used as a food source by the many different types of bacteria living in our gut. Now, prebiotics are different to probiotics. Probiotics are living bacteria that we ingest. So these can be in the form of those supplements, the fermented milks, uh, and even in yogurt. So what this does is deliver one big hit of good bacteria to the gut at a time. Whereas prebiotics are foods that feed the bacteria we already have living inside of us. So our main research question is whether honey is a good prebiotic. We know that honey is made up mostly of simple sugars, fructose and glucose, but there are some complex sugars that we don't digest that could be driving some of this prebiotic activity in our gut. So I first started looking at this during my PhD using a gut model in the laboratory. Similar to what's happening in this cartoon, we use digestive enzymes and other compounds to treat the honey as if it were passing through the digestive tract. And then we use that digested honey to feed our gut microbes that exist in our stool. So here I looked at 20 Australian honeys from different floral sources, including eucalypt, canola and leptospermum, or those manuka type honeys. And to sum up those four years in one little cartoon, we found that all honeys showed prebiotic potential because they either boost the numbers of the beneficial bacteria, reduce the numbers of the harmful bacteria, or increase the production of beneficial compounds called short chain fatty acids. These are made by our gut bacteria and they help to fight off different types of gut diseases. So the honeys all did slightly different things or a combination of all of these things. So even though they weren't all exactly the same, uh, they all did have some kind of prebiotic effect. We then ran a pilot clinical study with healthy volunteers, looking at whether a small daily dose of honey would show similar results to our laboratory model. So we looked at changes in the gut populations uh, of our volunteers and the compounds that the bacteria were producing. Again, this was done from stool samples collected before and after honey consumption from our volunteers. And here in the results, the grey lines show the response of the individual participants and the solid black lines show the overall trend before and after eating honey for a month. And what we found was that honey helped to boost the numbers of the beneficial bacteria here in the blue and the green, so the lactobacilli and bifidobacteria. And it helped to reduce the numbers of the potentially harmful bacteria, the Clostridia group here circled in the red. We also saw that honey helped our gut microbes produce more beneficial compounds, which play a protective role in the development and progression of many gut related conditions. And it didn't seem to matter which of the honeys we used in this study. The prebiotic activity we saw was not linked to a particular floral type. In particular, it was this reduction in the potentially harmful bacteria, the clostridial group, uh, circled in the red, that was really exciting for us because C. difficile infection is caused by species of bacteria from this group. So we wanted to understand if we could use honey either to prevent or treat infections in the gut. So our current project aims to tease this apart a little bit more. 
We're looking at a couple of New South Wales derived honeys that are produced in high volume, but don't necessarily demand those really high premium prices. And we have two main approaches. We're running a clinical study to understand exactly what changes eating honey has on our gut. We're looking at the populations of bacteria, the compounds that they produce, and also how these changes might influence our immune response. By understanding these trends better, we may be able to identify certain gut conditions that could be targeted with honey. So recruitment for this clinical study is underway, but sadly we were very much affected by the COVID-19 restrictions and we couldn't recruit participants for well over a year. So hopefully by next field day, uh, I hope that we can discuss the results from the clinical study. We're also using gut models in the laboratory to look at whether honey can help to target certain gut infections. And I'll present some of those results now. So I had an honours student this year, Izzy, who looked at three main areas. First, we wanted to look at whether honey could reduce the numbers of the potentially harmful bacteria already living in our gut. So these, these bacteria live in our gut in a balance with our good bacteria, but if something happens where that balance is slightly off, they can very quickly overpopulate and start to cause infections. We also looked at whether honey could help to treat a C. difficile infection in a simulated model. So we pretended like we were infecting um, a normal gut with C. difficile, and this is all in the laboratory model. And finally, we looked at whether honey helps our gut microbes produce compounds that can kill potentially harmful invaders that cause infections in the gut. So rather than using honey directly to treat those pathogens that cause infections, can we use honey to feed our own gut microbes who then indirectly will go off and produce those compounds that can kill the gut pathogens? So Izzy chose three honeys to test in her models this year. We had a jelly bush honey that's prized for its high antibacterial activity, but very little is known about its prebiotic activity. We had a commercial honey that has low antibacterial activity and high, uh, a high concentration of the complex sugars called oligosaccharides that we think are contributing to the prebiotic effect. So that one was Oli K8. And finally, we have a New South Wales yellow box honey that has low antibacterial activity and from my PhD studies showed good promise as a prebiotic. We also included a positive control called inulin, which is a commercially available complex sugar, often referred to as the gold standard prebiotic. So we set up these laboratory gut models using stool samples from a healthy volunteer as the inoculum source, and this represents the diversity of the bacterial populations in our gut. We then add either the honeys or the inulin positive control, and we also have a similar setup with no honey and no inulin, and this is our negative control. We then count the change in the potentially harmful bacteria already living in the gut before and after treatment with honey. Specifically, we were looking at the populations of Salmonella and E. coli, which are the main culprits for food poisoning, and populations of C. difficile, which causes the C. difficile infection I've already talked about, and inflammation of the bowels. So here we're looking at how the numbers of Salmonella and E. coli change before and after honey treatment. The dark grey bars represent the before, the lighter greys represent after. And what we can see is that all three honeys were very good at reducing the numbers of these harmful bacteria, especially when we compare it to the negative control when there's no honey in that, in that gut model setup. When we look at the change in the C. difficile populations, the results were a little bit different. Two of the honeys seems to actually promote the growth of the C. difficile. So you can see that the after bars are actually bigger than the before bars. Uh, and this was pretty disheartening, especially compared to the positive and the negative control where we didn't see this happen. So overall, it looks like honey can reduce the numbers of some potentially harmful bacteria in the gut, but not necessarily all. Next, we wanted to simulate a C. difficile infection. So we set up the gut models like before with the stool samples and honey, inulin or no honey, and then we added a dose of C. difficile to replicate a gut infection. We then counted the numbers of C. difficile before and after honey treatment. So like before, the darker grey bars show the number of C. difficile before the honey treatment and the lighter grey bars show after the honey treatment. And what we found was that honey did reduce the numbers of C. difficile in this infection model from before to after for each of these honeys, but it wasn't as effective as a negative control. So actually having no honey in the system in this case 
was better than having honey or inulin in the system at all. So you can see that the bar, um, the after bar with the no honey control dropped significantly more than whether when honey or inulin were in the system. So, so far it looks like honey might not be a suitable option to use on C. difficile directly. But from our other studies, we do know that it can have some kind of effect on this clostridial group. So our next step was to see whether honey was helping our other gut microbes kill off pathogens. So rather than honey having a direct effect, could we feed our other gut microbes honey to make them produce compounds that could then kill pathogens like C. diff? So that's what we looked at here. We set up our gut model in the same way as before with the stool sample and honey or our positive and negative control. And after letting the bacteria feed on the honey and make their compounds, we took just those compounds of interest to see how good they were at inhibiting the pathogens of the gut. And what we found was that honey was very effective at helping our microbes produce these compounds that kill pathogens. So we tested this on Salmonella and E. coli, those food poisoning pathogens, and they weren't able to grow at all. So when we use these compounds that were produced by our gut bacteria feeding on honey, these pathogens couldn't grow at all. And you can see that when we compare it to the no honey bar, the one at the end, our negative control, that bar is really big, which represents really high growth. So compared to that, our honeys and our inulin control uh, were very effective. We also saw a similar trend with the C. diff when honey was used in the system. Our gut bacteria were able to produce these compounds that stopped or slowed down the growth of C. difficile compared to when there was no honey in the system at all. So it looks like even though honey might not have a direct killing effect on C. difficile in the gut, we can still manage the numbers of C. difficile by using honey to feed our other gut microbes, which can then produce these compounds that inhibit the growth of C. difficile. So to sum up, we think that honey can be an effective prebiotic and it can do this by reducing the numbers of potentially harmful bacteria already living in the gut. It can also reduce the numbers of bacteria that cause food poisoning and also the harmful C. difficile, but we need to do a little bit more work here to understand if it works better as a preventative approach or a treatment, especially for the C. diff uh, infection model. And finally, when our gut bacteria are in the presence of honey, they themselves can produce compounds that kill invading harmful bacteria. And this could prevent an infection from occurring, and that means we don't have to have the honey working directly on pathogens in the gut. And overall, the work that we do in the bioactive honey space really highlights the different therapeutic properties of honey and how they can be exploited in different ways to target different conditions or issues. So some might be best suited as prebiotics to boost gut health in healthy people. Others might be used as a prebiotic tool to treat certain gut infections. And others still might be best for their antimicrobial activity topically or their anti-inflammatory activity. So what are we working on next? Well, we're just starting a new project under the New South Wales uh, Government Bushfire Recovery Scheme, where we'll do some more work in the bioactive honey space to add value to Australian honey. Specifically, we want to focus again on the prebiotic and antimicrobial activity of honey, but this time we want to see how these are affected by a variety of different factors. So things like floral source, for example, when bees are feeding on a mostly monofloral crop versus a diverse diet. Uh, what do the bees contribute to the bioactivity of the honey? So we'll be looking at the hive health, the age of the queen, whether the bees or the hive has been fed supplements, and also how do the stresses on bees affect that bioactivity of honey? And for stresses, we'll be looking at things like environmental stresses, whether that's climate, bushfires, drought. We'll be looking at chemical stresses like pesticides or insecticides or the use of antibiotics or stresses of pollination as well and how that affects the bioactivity of honey. So I'll just finish off by thanking the many researchers that have contributed to all the bioactive honey projects. Uh, of course, our funding bodies, AgriFutures, the Honey Bee and Pollination Program has funded most of the work that I've presented today. Um, and our new grant under the New South Wales Government Bushfire Industry Recovery Package will be funding the new project that we're doing. The biggest thanks to the Australian and particularly the New South Wales beekeepers, because not only would we not be able to do this work without you, but our research really wouldn't mean as much if we couldn't help to support this crucial industry in some kind of small way. And thanks to everyone who's attending today. If there are any questions, I'd love to hear from you. So please reach out at any time. Thanks.